Ever since the days of our distant ancestors, the human urge for exploration and territorial expansion has regularly been thwarted by Mother Nature, who, in winding her watery way across the earth, has often forced us to take the long way round. For primitive humans, rivers and gorges were natural barriers, but it was only a matter of time until our rapidly evolving brains came up with the solution. You build a bridge. So, what is a bridge? In simple terms, a bridge is a structure connecting two geographical points across a natural obstacle. Thanks to our old friend gravity, everything on the earth has a weight, or as we call it in engineering terms, a load. And all materials, whether natural or man-made, have different properties, strengths and weaknesses. The more load a bridge will have to hold, the stronger it has to be. Before we go any further, there are two very important forces we must familiarise ourselves with. The first force is compression. Compression is how much a material squashes when we apply load to it. The second force is tension. Tension is how stretchy a material is. The forces of compression and tension play a vital role in bridge building although we don't normally notice either of these forces until something goes wrong. The earliest bridges in human history would have been no more than a log or fallen tree placed across a gap. This is fine for short distances, providing you have a good balance, but it wasn't going to help mankind much in the long run. Another early form of bridge was the rope bridge, used by the Inca people to cross the butt-clenchingly steep canyons of South America. Rope bridges were made by weaving together natural materials, such as vines, then anchoring them on either side of the gorge and were hugely important for connecting previously unconnected communities, mainly for the purposes of trading, hugging and dancing, all the while avoiding death's icy claw. The real story of bridges, however, starts around the year 2000 BC, when ancient Sumerian builders were scratching their heads over the question of how to build a stone structure that could bear weight over a gap. It wasn't bridges they were building, but doorways, although the principle was the same, and they came up with an idea that would change the world of bridge building forever, the stone arch. There are two features a stone arch needs to avoid becoming a pile of rubble. The first is abutments. Abutments hold up the arch and transfer the weight, or load, down into the arch's foundations. The second feature of an arch is the keystone, a wedge-shaped block held in place by the surrounding blocks and the downward force of gravity. Keystones work through compression against the structure itself, so in theory, the more load there is, the stronger the bridge becomes. The ancient Romans were the first civilization to truly embrace the arch bridge. They built them all over the place, and even used them to transport water into their cities. Unfortunately for their enemies, the Romans much preferred killing to dancing or hugging, and used arch bridges to great effect to march troops to every corner of their empire. Although the Roman Empire has long since crumbled, many of the stone arches they built survive to this day. Now that we know how arches work, Let's fast forward through time a little bit to one of the first bridges ever to span the mighty River Tees, the Yarm Masonry Arch. The Yarm Masonry Arch was built in the year 1400 on the orders of Bishop Skirlow of Durham, famous for his amazing hairstyle. As with all stone arches, a timber scaffold was needed to support the blocks until the all-important keystone was put into place. Being a very strong material under compression, a stone arch offered greater strength than a wooden bridge would so it could bear heavier loads, as well as being more resistant to weathering and flooding. Despite taking years to build, the Yarm Masonry Arch is as strong today as it was 600 years ago. For the next 300 years, humans continued to build bridges using the same tried and tested techniques. And it wasn't until the late 1700s that an altogether different material emerged, allowing us to produce bridges stronger and longer than ever before. That material was cast iron, and it was something of a game changer. In 1841, a huge seam of iron ore was discovered in Middlesbrough's Eston Hills, transforming the sleepy village of Eston into a bustling mine community and propelling Teesside to the forefront of the worldwide iron and steel industry. Construction began on Victoria Jubilee Bridge in 1882, taking five years to complete and linking the towns of Stockton and Thornaby. The Victoria Bridge is made largely from wrought iron with stone foundations and abutments. Each arch consists of eight iron ribs, cast off site, then transported and lowered into position, then supported by wrought iron braces and transverse members. Lastly, the decking was laid and the bridge was ready to party. Unlike the Yarm Masonry Arch, where the main force involved was compression, 
The Victoria Bridge brings more of our second force into the equation, tension. Here's how it works. When a steel arch is bearing a load, the top of the bridge generally undergoes compression, the downward squashy force, and the underside of the bridge experiences tension, the stretchy force. The shallower the arch, the more tension the underside of the bridge will experience. As a building material, the strength of iron was unmatched, meaning you could build bigger arches, and unlike stone, you didn't need temporary scaffolding to hold it up. At the turn of the 20th century, the Tees was an incredibly busy river, with lots of ships passing back and forth, including ships with masts up to 50 metres tall. The question now was how do you build a bridge tall enough to allow these towering vessels to pass safely underneath? Step in local firm Cleveland Bridge and Engineering Company to provide an ingenious solution in the shape of the Middlesbrough Transporter Bridge, a fascinating structure that bends the rules a bit when compared to the two bridges we've looked at so far. Built in 1911, the Middlesbrough Transporter Bridge is what's technically called a cantilevered truss gondola bridge. That might sound a bit complicated at first, so let's break it down into parts we can understand. A cantilever is engineering speak for a beam anchored only at one end. Truss is just a technical word for a steel frame, and a gondola is what you might use in a ski resort to get to the top of a mountain. The frame of the transporter bridge is made from steel, a version of iron modified with extra carbon atoms to make it even stronger. The bridge is constructed of two cantilevers, one on either side of the river, both of which are counterweighted. The gondola runs on rails fixed to the underside of the structure and can carry 200 pedestrians on nine cars from bank to bank in just 90 seconds. Most importantly, it meant high-masted ships could transport their precious cargo down the river unimpeded. Like all steel structures, it needs regular painting to protect it from the weather, as well as regular checks on the moving parts to keep it running smoothly. The transporter bridge is pretty exciting, but hold on to your hats, because things are going to get even more exciting with the next bridge on our list, the Tees Viaduct. You could be forgiven for thinking that the Tees Viaduct hasn't got much party, but you'd be wrong. It's got loads. Ready, aim, fire. Built between 1973 and 1975, the Tees Viaduct is a composite deck beam bridge sitting on supporting piers. The key to a successful beam bridge is that it has to withstand heavy loads at its weakest points. To this end, the Tees Viaduct has a dirty secret. Reinforced concrete. Reinforced concrete is concrete laced with steel bars. On its own, concrete can be brittle and doesn't respond well to being stretched. The internal steel bars allow the concrete to withstand greater amounts of tension, while still utilising concrete's ability to withstand compression, therefore taking advantage of the benefits of both materials. You still awake? Good. As cars travel across the viaduct, the compressive force radiates outwards along the top of the bridge and down the supports to the earth. The underside of the bridge experiences tension as it bends beneath the load, which can be up to 70,000 vehicles every day. Reinforced concrete allows for a larger span, is highly durable and allows architects to design structures in a whole range of shapes that would be impossible with other materials. The Tees Viaduct is the largest steel plate girder and composite deck bridge in the British Isles. So, despite its slightly dull appearance, it's kind of a big deal. The final stop on our tour through Tees Time and Space is the Tees Key Millennium Footbridge, the cable stayed cantilever bridge. With the cable stayed design, the central mast bears all the weight, absorbing the compressional forces and transferring them down its base. The cables holding up the decking are steel tendons connected to the top of the 40 metre mast and fanning out along the bridge's length. There are many far larger examples of cable stayed road bridges around the world, but this being a footbridge, a cable stayed design offered a cost effective way of achieving the required span, as it was only necessary to build foundations for the central mast, rather than lots of expensive towers and abutments. Consequently, the Millennium footbridge would be unable to support heavy loads, but is fine for lighter loads, such as cyclists and pedestrians. So, where does Teesside go from here? And to think, it all started with a simple log or fallen tree across a stream. It begs the question, what would our distant ancestors make of Stockton's super sleek 15 million pound infinity bridge? As we continue to find more innovative ways of using established materials, as well as developing an array of increasingly strong and lightweight new materials, such as carbon fibre tubing, 
it makes you wonder what bridges across the Tees will look like in years to come, and who will design these exciting new structures. Perhaps it could be you.